Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Drew Jacobs, and I'm uh, one of the, the product marketing leads here with CA, and specifically with the Agile Management Business Unit. Um, we've got a really fun topic today, and I'm here on stage with three people. Um, Ryan Bodge, who is uh, the head of uh, uh, racing marketing for Trek. Is that a fair characterization? I don't know about the head, but... <laughs> the head, okay. It's certainly part of the process. Part of the process, of the process. Um, and, and manages a lot of the programs for all of, all of Trek's uh, uh, racing endeavors. Um, and then we have Peter Stetna and Kiel Reinen on stage, and, and uh, uh, professional since... 2008 professional cyclist is that uh, give or take a little bit? Uh, yeah, Osmanos. Osmanos, yeah, eight, eight, eight years or so, um, and uh, both uh, spent time in, in Europe uh, this last season. Both rode what's called a Grand Tour, uh, the Tour de France, the Vuelta a España, or the Tour of Spain, and uh, we're gonna have a little fun today. We're gonna we're gonna keep this a little bit interactive. I'm gonna spend a few minutes uh, talking about um, some of the ways that Trek is is uh, working with CA from a technology standpoint. And then we're going to have kind of an open panel Q&A discussion, and, and we'll have some fun with that. We've got a few things we're going to talk to the riders about here upstage, uh, on stage, excuse me. And then we're going to open it up to you all, too. So if, uh, be thinking about some questions as we go through this, and you're welcome to come up. There's a microphone there, and, uh, and we'll get into it. So, so thank you. That we don't need to talk about. Um, talked a little bit about our guests today. Uh, oh, really excited to have you guys here. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here. Those are some great shots, too. Um, We'll spend a little more time with you guys in a second. So, so one of the things we, we talk a lot about is, is um, our partnership with the Trek Sega Freighter Racing Team. And, and a lot of people ask, well, why would a technology company like CA sponsor a professional cycling team? Um, so one of the things we like to talk about is it's, it's, it's a lot more than just a sponsorship. It's a partnership. And when we started to have conversations with the team uh, early on this, this year in, in January, um, we kind of centered on a couple things. One, we, we wanted to work with a world-class team, and, and, and that's really what we have in Trek Sigafredo. This is a team that is absolutely the top of its game, but I think most importantly, and, and for those of you that heard Angela Tucci's um, uh, keynote yesterday, it's, it's a team that is constantly wanting to innovate, constantly wanting to perform better. Um, I know these guys want to win more races. You can't win every single one of them, but this is a team that's always striving to perform better. Um, so that was, that was one kind of criteria that we wanted, we wanted to, to focus on, um, an innovative company and an innovative team. The other one, um, really an organization that is data-driven. Cycling is a, is a really um, uh, complex sport. It's a very te technical sport, um, but it's an organization that, that really relies on data to, to enable performance. Cycling teams, too, are, are inherently agile. They are constantly iterating uh, to perform better. They are, are constantly thinking about how to improve. And they're constantly taking feedback from the riders and from the organization to improve um, uh, their performance. And, and, and we wanted to work with a collaborative organization. Um, and we, we really found that with, with, with this organization. This is an organization that is wonderful to work with. They're, they're very open. They're very transparent. And, and they constantly want to break down the barriers that oftentimes uh, kind of get in the way of, of uh, communication and collaboration. And so we found a great partnership uh, with the team. I think the other thing that's, that's really worth noting, too, is, um, is we started to talk to the team about how we could support them from a technology standpoint, being a software company, obviously. We saw a lot of parallels in some of the challenges that the, the team has in the context of what is a very complex environment that they have to operate in um, for many, many days of the year. And, and Ryan's going to spend a little bit of time here in a, in a couple minutes and talk about what, is that, what does that really look like. But um, we saw a lot of parallels between that and, and software teams that we work with every day. How, do we help it, how, do we help, how can we help teams better communicate and collaborate? How can we help teams um, really break down some of the barriers um, to collaboration? And then, and then most importantly, and, or as I think really excitingly, um, how can we actually help, help the organization accelerate its feedback loops and innovation loops? And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute as well. We saw a lot of great parallels with, with a lot of the, the technical teams and the software project teams inside your organizations that we work with every day. Um, for those of you, and so this is kind of to underscore that innovation point, for those of you that saw Angela Tucci's keynote, and you've probably seen this picture um, a lot uh, over the last couple days, um, one of the things we really focused on was how, how can we really help the team shorten the, the feedback loop from a, from a product R&D standpoint. One of the things that's kind of unique, or somewhat unique, I think, about the, the, the Trek team is that they are sponsored by a bike manufacturer um, and, and, a, and a coffee manufacturer as well in Sigafredo. 
Trek leverages the team heavily to capture feedback on their products in the field. So as these guys are out there in, in some of the, the, the most extreme environments, testing the latest bike frame, testing the latest wheel, testing the latest handlebar, they've got to get that information back to Trek corporate and, and uh, get that then into the R&D teams, the engineering teams, to enhance that and to tune it and, and make it the best product it can be. And, and those products ultimately translate down into things that all of us can go to the store and buy, for the most part, I think. Um, so uh, uh, that's something that we really wanted to, to work with the team on as well. So kind of just to summarize this real quick, um, we really wanted to focus on helping them in three things. And they really outlined three problems. Help us communicate better, help us collaborate better, help us shorten the product development feedback loops. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. He's going to talk a little bit for a minute about what does it really mean um, in, in the frenetic atmosphere of a professional cycling team and the many, many racing days that, that go on throughout the year? Um, what are some of the challenges that actually arise in communicating and collaborating? Um, so share a little bit of that with us. Yeah, you mentioned frenetic, but I think a more accurate description is logistical nightmare. Um, at any one time, we have three different teams racing simultaneously in different time zones, different continents, different places, 40 staff, 28 riders, you're getting to the stage, you're getting the equipment ready, you're getting all the communications that go along with that ready, you're getting all sorts of secure data transferred around to, from riders to racers, to staff members, to people back at Trek HQ. It's, it's immense and uh, the, the communications demand is really, really quite large. So having a safe and secure place to make all those communications happen is really, really what we were looking for and what we use basically every day. Yeah, yeah. very intense. And you know, I, I will say I, I had a, a really an opportunity to go visit what's called the service course, uh, which is really the central hub for the, the team operations in Belgium earlier this year. And walking into that warehouse and seeing all of the equipment, all of the vans, the cars, all of the things that needed to go in and out to various countries and races um, at any given moment, it was absolutely yeah. daunting. The, the team has two huge buses. We have equipment buses. We have, I think, something like 14 cars, two vans. I mean, it's a fleet of vehicles. And uh, they're, they're traveling all over Europe. They're traveling all at the same time. And uh, when you have 40 staff members, all speaking different languages sometimes, all operating in completely different time zones, you need a pretty dynamic solution in order to kind of corral the craziness a little bit. Yeah, so absolutely. it definitely helps. Absolutely, and at the end of the day, it's all, make, it's all about making sure that these guys can be as successful as they can yeah. in the field. We don't, and... we don't want them to see any of this. You know, right. We want them to be focused on the race <laughs> and not have to worry about any of the stresses that go along with this basically a moving circus. You know, When you have a stage race, you basically have anywhere from seven to 21 days of racing, traveling along basically in a connected fashion all around a country or sometimes multiple countries. So to say that there are some pretty intense needs that go along with organizing and, and basically keeping that, that train on the tracks, it's a pretty severe understatement. Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot to do. Absolutely. So, so w w what did that kind of bring us to in terms of, of uh, some technology that we could help the, the team out with? Um, we have a product called FlowDoc, and some of you may have heard about that and, and uh, may, might have seen it over in, uh, in the Agile Zone um, on some of the demo pods. It's a collaboration platform, and it's a collaboration platform that, though originally designed to help software development teams collaborate and share information around software projects, so software features, um, it's, it's, a, it's a product that's really ideally suited for this environment. It combines team chat, it combines an inbox, and it combines threaded and searchable discussions uh, in one platform. And so uh, when you think about kind of, you know, what, what a lot of us face every day uh, in terms of, of um, kind of the communication channels that we operate in, you know, it really gives the, the team an ability to leverage one application, stay in context, and instead of, you know, as an example, sending multiple emails back and forth to address a logistical issue inside the team or a travel issue, which I know is a pretty common one, <laughs> or a hospitality issue. Travel's, I'm sure, really simple. Never, yeah. Nothing ever goes wrong there. <laughs> um, um, you know, this is something that allows them to do that all in one context in one app. And so uh, it centralizes that communication, it makes it searchable, and um, it, it really has cut down on a lot of, I think, the chatter and the back and forth that goes on uh, uh, you know, in, in the day-to-day -day communications of the, of the organization. Um, 
there's a really cool video we're going to show you guys and uh, uh, that, that I'm going to let Ryan kind of frame up a little bit here that I think is a, is a great demonstration. And I really purposely wanted to show this video instead of getting up here and showing you screenshots because I think this is a, a, a neat, neat summary of kind of the, the day in the life of a cyclist and how they're actually leveraging some of this technology. Yeah. So. I think almost, init almost immediately when we started using Flowdoc, we realized, wow, this is a pretty dynamic solution to a lot of our problems. And we wanted to paint the picture a little bit and show exactly how every single person on the team is communicating with one another to basically help us get to the race. And sometimes I like to joke it's pretty much a race to get to the start to the race. And uh, we wanted to kind of show what goes on behind the scenes a little bit and how we leverage Flowdoc to make it a reality. Very cool. Uh, let's see the video. Very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. I mean, I think in just the morning, you know, you've got equipment choice, you've got team plan, you've got product feedback stuff. It's all happening just before the race even starts. And uh, there's, if you're traveling in Europe, your bags will be lost. So <laughs> it's, I think that's something that the team always is dealing with is getting to the airport, having some, we need, where are the bags, where are the clothes, you know, making sure that everything's there at the race. So having one place to get all those communications done, it's, it's a dream, honestly. It's a dream come true. Awesome, awesome. Well, I, um, we're gonna shift a little bit to some, some Q&A with, with uh, Peter and, and Keel, if that's okay. Um, we just saw a great snippet, uh, as Ryan was saying, kind of a, a glimpse into your life, uh, maybe you know, at, at the beginning of a race. Um, walk us through kind of what's, what's a typical day for you guys at a race like that? Um, what does it look like from you know, when you get up in the morning to when you finish the race? Uh, or if there is a typical day. Uh, <laughs> but what, is that, what does that look like for you I mean, that, that video is a surprisingly accurate depiction of, of what we're doing. It really is that chaotic, um, especially when you're, you know, you're in a different hotel every single night. And, and so you, you rarely have your bearings when you wake up and like you have to remind yourself what country you're in and what race you're at. And, and so um, having everything you know, accessible uh, because you know, they can tell us what the daily plan is. Um, but after you're done with a race, especially a hard one, you don't remember anything. So you're constantly needing to look back and see, okay, what, you know, what did we say? Did we change that? Did it end up getting changed? Um, so there's a lot of a lot of on the fly um, type decisions that, that you know we need to be able to reference. I think the, the one of the biggest pieces um, for us using Flowdoc is relevancy. So um, if you're just using email uh, with the team, like Barbara, the logistics manager, um, she puts together a uh, travel schedule for everyone for a particular race. Uh, so that's kind of you were asking about a day in the life. You know, before a race, we get a Excel spreadsheet or you know some type of document that basically lines out all of the, the travel, travel logistics for the team. 
then there's a lot of changes to that document. It used to be that we would get a new email from Barbara every time. So someone said, oh, I got to bring a bike because my other bike broke. And oh, I needed to change my flight because I'm coming from this other race. I'm not flying on my home airport. Every time there was a change, we would get a new email with an updated sheet. And uh, now you can just go into FlowDoc type in, you know, at uh, Tour de Suisse for that particular race and see everything that's relevant for, for Tour de Suisse. So you're not seeing the things that don't pertain to you. You know, I don't care if Pete's bringing an extra bike. It doesn't affect mm -hmm. my travel uh, unless, you know, I'm carrying it around the airport for him. Yeah. So Which happens. <laughs> Does that happen very often? Or? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. He's my character. Yeah, we spent more uh, nights together for like a month and a half long stretch than we did with our wives. Yeah. So there's a lot of travel involved. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> A lot of uh, a lot of different hotels, a lot of different countries. Cool, very cool. Um, Peter, anything to add that or? In no. Um, yeah, you know, it's just it's a traveling circus, so to have it streamlined and uh, it it makes a big difference, and especially for the staff behind the scenes, even more so because I mean, we really are just one trick ponies. I mean, yeah. we just. They try to make it as easy as possible on us. We yeah. show up to the race, there's food on the table, there's, we just literally have to worry about pedaling fast, but there's all the other changes that are happening with weather and yeah. wind and all that, that the staff really have to do it on the fly that minute. And I mean, because I'm flip-flopping my wheel choices until 10 minutes before the start anyway. Yeah. And, I mean, for, for example, um, that race, Tour de Suisse, um, the route for that race was released probably nine months prior. Mm -hmm. um, so we knew roughly, you know, this, these are the mountains we're climbing, this is what we're getting into. Um, these are the kind of you know, wheels, cassettes we want to use for the race. Uh, but on the final stage of that race, it was switched from a 170 kilometer long stage to a 65 kilometer yeah. long stage. They took out one mountain uh, because of inclement weather. And that meant the buses had to leave at different times. They had to, uh, the start was not where it was originally planned. They had to cart us up over the mountain. And you know, the, a huge amount of um, the logistical changes went you know, into making that possible all within a couple of hours and the idea is that we don't notice the change we just get on the bus uh, like we would have if it had been in the normal start and we don't we don't see the the chaos that's behind the scenes yeah and another cool thing we would use it for was uh like during the tour de france this year we had a special tour de france tech because you know the tour is the biggest race so every every bike company kind of brings out their latest new models and there's a lot of undercover stuff going on new testing and uh so we actually just had one flow for the riders in the tour team that was between us and uh, our Trek uh, company liaison. And uh, so if I saw something like, hey, this guy on uh, this specialized helmet, this is new, it looks a little different, check it out. They could know to just go straight to the photos of that rider during the stage. And so they were getting intel that way. Um, and then we have a whole nother flow for just clothing. If they sent me a new piece of clothing, uh, actually, that jersey I'm wearing in the picture was a brand new summer suit. It's like a one-piece suit, but it was a summer weight. No one had had it before. So uh, you want feedback on that, but you don't have to deal with all the other logistical stuff. So it was nice to just separate it all. Yeah. And, and it's secure. The, you know, this is becoming yeah, ever more a sport of marginal gains. And so everybody's looking for a competitive edge, whether that's uh, equipment, nutrition, you know, clothing, everything. And so uh, training and information. And when our, you know, training staff tells us, you know, what we need to be doing for riding or they discover, you know, a new superfood, um, we want to kind of keep that, that information protected. You know, we, we don't, you, you are always looking around at the other teams and seeing where they're getting an advantage, whether it's a new helmet design or a new brake. There's a lot of that um, has just become more important over the last kind of decade. Very cool. Very cool. Um, maybe shift uh, to, the, to the physical aspect for a second. You know, you, you, you kind of shared a little bit of the, the, what the day in the life looks like at a, at, a, at, a, at a race. When you look at, you know, the, the, the notion of a grand tour and a, a 20 or 21 day race, 2,000 miles day after day, I think they sprinkle, give you guys a, a token rest day in there or two <laughs> once yeah. in a while. Um, what does it feel like? I mean, what does it feel like to, at the start? What do you feel like midway through? What do you feel like at the end? What does your body go through uh, uh, in that respect? Oh yeah, I've done a few Grand Tours now, but Kiel just did his first one this year, the Vuelta, so it's probably fresher in his head, the whole, uh, the tiredness yeah, and the highs and lows. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you, know, you have days where um, you're so physically exhausted uh, that you can't 
you can't think, you just kind of, you're running around in a haze and a fog and um, everything in your body is screaming no and you're telling it yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about cycling is, you know, it's individual in the sense that you're, you have to power yourself uh, across the entire course start to finish. Um, but you're sort of at the mercy of the pace of the peloton. So on a particular day you wake up and you say, I'm, today is going to be a rough day for me. I, you know, I got to conserve. Um, you can only race so conservatively if, if the peloton decides this is, this is game on, like this is the stage, we're going to blow it up and you know, so-and-so is going to try and snag the lead. Um, there's nothing you can do to control that. So sort of the, I think the hardest part is being that, that fatigued um, and you're, just, you're relying solely on your willpower at, at that point, and, but not having, uh, you can't quantify what's coming. So you don't know, you know, you know how long the stage is, but because you don't know what you're, you know, the peloton can choose to torture you all day and yeah. you can't do anything about it. So the sort of unknown of... of and it's also, uh, it's pretty crazy, like, uh, how much of a machine you realize the human body can be. I mean, there's a, like, a fun fact is during a stage race, like the tour, you have to eat the equivalent of a Thanksgiving Day meal every meal of the day to not lose weight. Like, we, we're, we're putting down 8,000 calories a day yeah. on average, and, uh, and your body is just efficient, so it's burning through that the whole time. Um, and there's no real reason why, like, three weeks is the limit for the human body. Like, who decided three weeks? Like, so why not 22 days, 24 days? Why not 14 days? Um, and it was just interesting, is like, when you do everything right and they have it down to such a science, I mean, you take the protein at this time, you get massage at this time, it's just everything is so streamlined. You can do it day after day, but like, and there's no reason we couldn't do it for four weeks. But then I remember when you finally finish that grand tour, you go out to a nice dinner, you celebrate a bit, you have a few glasses of wine. The next morning you are just buckled. Yeah. You're buckled and your body shuts down. It, it honestly, yeah, it shuts down, but it also thinks that you're, you have to do it again the next day. So you start holding on to all these, yeah. uh, all the fluids too, and you start bloating, and it's it's not good for your system. It's yeah, unhealthy. It's not healthy. <laughs> it's definitely but, unhealthy. Yeah. yeah, I remember. I, I I went to the hospitality event at the end of the tour this year, and <laughs> you guys came in and you did a talk, and I just remember you all sitting there, and, and they had food out, and and it was like the buffet had arrived. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine. We could all be so lucky to be able to uh, eat eat a Thanksgiving dinner every meal, but uh, I realize it doesn't always work that way. So, um, well, maybe go back to, from a technology standpoint for a second. I think, you know, it, as outsiders and observers of the sport, whether you're casual or you're, you're, a, you're a, a hardcore fan, um, you know, I think a lot of us realize that, that there's a lot of technology in cycling. And, I, you know, and, and it is, and I say that certainly as an outsider from an equipment standpoint, it seems like there's a lot of technology. And there's been a lot of advancements, I think, um, in the industry. And I, you know, I put my lens on it, which is a very layman's lens that says, you know, I, I know I went from a steel frame to an aluminum frame, to a carbon fiber frame. None of them made me any faster, by the way, but that's a separate problem. Um, but uh, uh, you, you, we, we think about technology and cycling, I, I think we tend to think a lot about the equipment piece of it. And can you guys share a little bit, you know, when you, from when you started your careers to now, you know, what have you seen as some of the, the big advancements in cycling that, um, you know, that have really been kind of pivotal in the industry or, or even pivotal for you guys personally? Like, you know, what do you hold on to as, oh gosh, you know, have that now and I didn't have that five years ago and that's awesome. Uh, we, so we do spend a lot of time on the road uh, away from families and we were talking about this yesterday when I first started going to Europe racing um, I had a, a calling card you know yep. that you would you dial the number in and uh, you know put a hundred bucks on the card and um, call, call home that way and I would mail letters and now I'm video chatting you know with my mm -hmm. wife and kid back home um, from everywhere from Australia to Switzerland and so that like the seeing the technology shift um, that just happened there like that that almost affects us more than some of the on the bike stuff because um, we by the time we both turned pro like electronic shifting had already started we weren't necessarily on it all the time but that was already around um, the bikes though like well I guess there's been a lot of change with aerodynamics you know going yeah. going to aero helmets um, aero frames shapes um, and I think too that the the science behind the way riders are training has, has become so effective um, that everyone's within a smaller percentage range and so you you end up with 
sort of uh, there's not there's not as many as many competitive advantages to, to gaining anymore, glean anymore. So you you end up with you know 15 riders who can all win the race. So that makes for exciting racing, but it also means that those marginal gains matter. Yeah. So we kind of continue on on a related question for a second. You know, when you think about a lot of the the technology and advancements, and, and you know, I, I talked a little bit earlier about. Um, you know, one of the one of the things we want to help the team with is accelerate some of these R and D loops, right? And you guys are, are constantly in the field testing the next new frame, the next new wheel, um, and uh, and that's that's a really valuable thing for Trek then to get that feedback from you guys. Um, you know, obviously you're, you're putting it to, to to some pretty significant uh, paces and and in, in some of the hardest conditions. Um, talk to me a little bit about the importance of how that information is exchanged. And, and Ryan, if you want to jump in too, certainly. Um, and and uh, certainly how it's exchanged and, and what I would assume, and, and we know this a lot in the software industry, when you think about the proprietary nature and the security needs around some of that, I mean, this is, this is you know, this, these are products that, that are, you know, competitive advantages for Trex as, Trek as products in the market, for sure. Certainly competitive advantages for you all as, as riders trying to win races. Um, so share with, share with us a little bit about how you guys handle that process and, and what, you know, some of the importance around that. You should take that one. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a really, really good point. These, when we launch a bicycle, we don't want anyone to have ever seen it, ever, in any way whatsoever. So it's, it's, to say it's important for this information and these technologies to remain completely secret is another understatement. So um, it's a good point to start off with is that these guys can push a bike to its limit a lot better than me, anybody else. They're, going harder, faster, stronger than anyone goes. So that's why we rely so heavily on professionals to just to sculpt these bikes into the ultimate performance machine. And technologies that these guys help to refine trickle down throughout our entire product line. So, I mean, the reason that we race is to develop the world's best product in addition to help promoting our brand. So it's, it's absolutely the, the most important thing that we're doing. So to say that when they have feedback, whether it's taking pictures of the bicycle in the field, hey, this is not working, this right here, circling it, sending the images, or filling out forms about how it rode, how it's going, or doing any kind of information. Having a program to basically get that information back to not only the tech reps, but also to our designers and our engineers at Trek headquarters, it's very important, and we need it to be absolutely secure so that when it's launched, our competitors and the, and the consumers as well are having a wow experience and saying, how did they do this? How did we not know? Like, how could we not, you know, we don't ever want anyone to see what's going on. So it has to be secure. Yeah. Yeah. A good example this year is disc brakes. They're the hot topic. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether we should be using disc brakes. Are they safe? Uh, are they you know, better than conventional mm -hmm. brakes? Can some riders be on them while others aren't? And then all, all of the, uh, you know, industry companies need to figure out, okay, what's the standard size? How, you know, there has to be some standardization that happens before it can be streamlined into the Peloton. But so teams have been really secretive about their bikes with disc brakes. Uh, everyone's been testing those um, and, you know, giving feedback to, the, to their various sponsors about how, how they're functioning. Um, but the, the information that, you know, we, we take and, and compile, if we can't get that to the right people, it doesn't, it's not effective. And so, you know, we can, and again, we're dealing with so many different languages. So maybe Pete rides a, a new bike with disc brakes. He says, yeah, these are, these are great, but I'm noticing on, you know, like really rough road surfaces, you know, the vibrations are causing the, the brake to get a little grabby, something like that. He can tell the mechanic that, but maybe the mechanic, his first language is Spanish. And so, he, you know, there's a little bit of mistranslation. He thinks the brakes are too firm. So he tightens them up and, you know, there, it's much easier for Pete to be able to just put the information, you know, into FlowDoc, send it out to the relevant individuals, yeah. and then they can reference, you know, back to it without having to call up Pete and ask questions all over again. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Um, maybe shift back to the, the personal part of it for a little bit. Um, what, what does the off season look like for you guys? You're, you're in it now, I think, um, and, uh, but I, I would assume training is not far off or is already happening a little bit perhaps. And what, how long do you guys have off the bike? What, what do you do in the off season? What does that look like? Well, uh, I've started training again. So I actually just yesterday finished a 30 hour week on the bike aside from weightlifting. And so you're doing five, six hours a day on the bike. Um, and just getting that base again. Uh, so normally the race season starts in January in Australia and it runs through uh, mid-October. Um, 
And then we all basically just kind of take a month off. Like, I, we don't worry about the bike. Uh, you just go hike, you do house projects, start drinking beer, just enjoy, relax, and uh, just have a normal life for a month. So you get a, it's nice. You get a month of uh, basically paid vacation. Um, but then you start training uh, November 1 again, and you just start putting the miles on and tuning up. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's the time of season when you can just take care of other things, which yeah. is, it's good. And you get family time, you know, vacation <laughs> is actually being at home for me, which is different than a lot of people view it, but yeah. Sure. What's, what's the favorite off season indulgence? <laughs> oh, well, uh, honey roasted peanut butter. Yeah? Yeah, uh, spice for okay. sure. I'm an IPA guy. I'm up in NorCal and we got some good IPA. I like uh, Pliny the Elder, if anyone knows it, but yeah. that's a mile from my house, so. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Very cool, cool. Well, we've got some time left. We wanted to um, open this up to some questions from the audience. Um, we have a microphone set up here. So if you all have some questions, um, come on up and, and ask. Uh, um, we have some time to do that. Does anyone have any questions? All right, easy. <laughs> got one. Um, so take aside your bike. Flow dock because that would be cheating. What's the one piece of technology you couldn't live without? Mm. The bike. Well, I mean, it's you know, it's communication lately in the phone. I mean, we're all attached to our phones nowadays, but like Keel was saying earlier, it's I mean, we spend 200 days a year on the road. And um, I mean, my wife, she doesn't travel with me. She's an engineer back in Santa Rosa. So uh, like, I mean, I need to talk to her every night. And uh, you know, that's the, having that phone and the, the, the way that technology is now and the, the FaceTime, that's all, uh, it's huge for staying in touch because I mean, it's, it sounds romantic, you know, just traveling the world and seeing these places. But you know, I've never been in the Louvre. I can't tell you what it looks like, but I just know like, what this cruddy little town in rural France looks like with the lady like hanging her sheets out the window. And so I see a different side of things, but there's a lot of downtime in the hotel. You're not allowed to go visit things and eat out. Like you're on the bed, resting, recovering, thinking about the next day. So being able to stay connected is a, it's for your mind, you know, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Happy racer is a fast racer. I would say, um an e-reader. It's impossible to lug yeah. enough books to Europe on a you know, three month long trip to uh, satiate your uh, appetite for reading when you're in a hotel room for 10 hours a day. So um, I like to read while I'm on the road and without that, I guess I would have to learn another language. <laughs> I mean, that's a, honestly a really good point that many people really don't realize is that when the race is done, it's not just like, all right, let's go hang out. Like you basically have to sit down or lay down oh. for the entire day in order to allow your body to repeat, rinse, repeat, and do that the next day. There's, you, you wouldn't be able to do it yeah. if you weren't completely off your feet. So there's a lot of downtime and you, yeah. gotta, and you have to kind of keep the mind alive a little bit or else yeah. you're, you'll probably start to lose it in a pretty profound <laughs> way. Yep. I loved your saying uh, you shared with me the other day of, you know, why stand when you can sit, why sit when you can lay down, and it seems yeah. like that's, yeah. that's a little bit of the adage you it, have to follow. It's, that's like the, 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 almost like the mantra that's taught to you at a relatively young age is just get off your feet. What are you, why are you standing up right now? Sit down. Why are you sitting? Lay down. Like, just relax. Yeah. So, and that's kind of the only way to keep, the, keep it moving if you're, if you're trying to do this thing. All about the recovery. It's all, yeah. 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 Well, it's weird. I mean, we don't even... Uh, we won't walk to restaurants. I mean, I, you, we become so specialized at pedaling a freaking bike that we don't, uh, like you actually get sore like yeah. walking around just to, to down the street to dinner. So we're always in the car and stuff. And <laughs> that's what off season's nice for too, is you can Feel walk like around Vegas and just yeah. go hike and not worry about it, but <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> awesome. I think we have another question or is a gentleman ready for a question? Come on up. I have a question around, you know, because it's obviously such a data-driven sport. When you're actually racing day-to-day, -day, whether it's, a, you know, one-day stage race or, you know, a grand tour, are you going by your body? Obviously, the peloton takes off. you got to go. But are, are you really looking at, are you really watching your watch the whole time? Are you glancing or do you just go by feel and look at data later? 
Um, I prefer to, yeah, sort of, I think that the data is most helpful when you're, when you're analyzing it after uh, an effort or during training uh, to have it for comparison purposes. During the race itself, you're, you're very much at the mercy of the race. Now, if you're having a good day and you're off the front of the race, you, you might get to decide the pace or dictate the pace. And on those type of days, um, I think being able to see power or heart rate to kind of keep yourself in check can be yeah. important. You know, like I, I probably used heart rate and, and power the most in the time trial of the Welta this year. And that wasn't because I was trying to win the time trial. It was because I wanted to know, I wanted to do as little as I could and still make time cut. And I didn't want to push myself above a certain point so that uh, you know, I could save more energy for the next day when I was better suited to the race. So that was a point where I, I really used the power meter, the heart rate, to, to keep myself from going harder than I needed to. No, data is best in training. And because you need to be able to hit the, know, know that you can do the numbers to be competitive, but racing itself is just action reaction. It's so reactionary that you just have to, yeah, it's, you don't, you don't get the luxury of uh, just dictating. And when you ride as much as we do too, like I could probably tell you within 15 watts what I'm doing, yeah. even if I'm not looking. And just to give everyone context, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, it, it's, cycling's become a very measured sport from a performance standpoint, and, and there are actually you know, uh, devices on your bikes now that actually measure the power output. There's, there's no more absolute measure than power, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're riding a machine, it's pulleys and levers, and it, it can be highly, highly measured and calibrated. Um, and that's used, I think, to great effect in training now uh, uh, as well. I mean, yeah, it tells us uh, calories burned, uh, kilojoules uh, and then wattage, you know, that's kind of the, the holy grail more than heart rate now because heart rate is so dependent on the body and watts are the real finite number. So, uh, um, for example, uh, climbing speeds in the Tour de France, it's all watts per kilogram of body weight. So it doesn't matter if, you know, I'm racing a 200 pound guy and I'm 140 pounds, like he'll have to push more watts than me. But if you can break it down to that ratio of watts per kilogram, a body weight, then that's the number. So uh, in in the top level of the sport, six watts per kilo on a climb is kind of like that's the holy grail. You know, that's what the guys who are winning are doing. So if you can go up a mountain pass for half an hour yeah. at six watts per kilo, then you know you're on the world class. And uh, and those and sometimes those numbers are actually what people can do. That number is actually quite secret. So you know. For example, at team camp last year, Bauka did not want anyone to know what his watts per kilo was because he was just absolutely petrified that someone was going to find that out and mm -hmm. get on and, and do this thing. So that's an, another really good example about if, if they share a training document with their coach who's across the planet, it's really important that no one, no one gets a hold of that. So it's, it's, it's quite, yeah. quite secretive information. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Any other questions from the audience? <laughs> I would love to hear how each of you got into and what your journey was to bringing you to the cycling world and professional racing. Um, I grew up on a small island uh, in the North Pacific Northwest, and there was a local bike shop um, with a fellow who had been a mechanic in Europe for a number of years with the national team. And I started riding my bike kind of, you know, to school and like all the other kids did. Um, and then I got into rowing crew. And um, by the time I was a sophomore in high school, this is as big as I got. And so I started <laughs> riding more and rowing less. And um, Paul, the fellow who owned the bike shop, convinced me to come out to a local race uh, one afternoon. And I got dropped, threw up, didn't finish and went back the next week and the next week and the next week and the next week. And um, it's, it's been really interesting to reflect, you know, now at this point in my career to see all the places I've been able to visit and, and enjoy because of, of cycling. I've been, I've raced on, in Africa, Australia, South America, Europe. Um, I've raced with some really good friends. I've made some really good friends. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a really nice career, a really fun ride. You don't have to join the Navy. You can be a professional cyclist in Sudan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I was a, a bit different. I runs in the family. My dad and my uncle were pros, um, and they never really pushed me into it. I just tried every sport as a kid. I was just stupidly competitive, and uh, 
I was uh, one of my uh, soccer teammates uh, joined the YMCA mountain bike team, and so we would go uh, ride our mountain bikes when we would travel to tournaments together. And uh, and then I joined the YMCA team with him. And my first race was the 24 Hours of Moab relay race, just playing out in the desert and camping. And uh, I got hooked from that. And then I had I had a lot of success early on. And then you know you you just enjoy as a kid and you're having fun. But then you kind of start realizing like you know as a as a 16 year old like I just won 50 bucks in this local race like I can kind of make something of this and then <laughs> you know and it keeps yeah it expands from there so. very very cool awesome time for one last question we have one <laughs> um, so you said you eat 8,000 calories a day <laughs> I want to know what you consume to eat uh, 8,000 calories all right so I this know is you're not eating Thanksgiving <laughs> every day well, this is the science part of it. I mean, they have it streamlined. So, um, you know, it's all about the breakfast is huge. Uh, three hours before the race to let yourself digest so you don't uh, hurl on the bike. And uh, yeah. it's a, you know, big bowl of oatmeal, uh, almond butter, coconut oil, some good fats, uh, fruit smoothie. Uh, make a lot of juice, actually, because it's less fiber. So it's because you're just always consuming uh, and you still get the nutrients in with the juice. Um, and then on the bike, uh, we eat minimum every hour while racing. Um, the maximum that a human can digest is about 300 calories an hour. Um, 400 if you're really in good shape and you're really cranking. Um, so basically that translates to every hour of a race. During the race, uh, we're eating like a full on energy bar, usually like one of those energy gels as well, drink and a bottle mix. of drink mix, like, you know, Gatorade or whatever that is. And, um, and then afterwards, I mean, we have to have usually a big plate of rice or some kind of cereal with the carbs quick in the system. Yeah, that's important that you do that immediately. Like off right the off the bike, uh, and then protein within an hour. And then dinner's like the one time where you kind of really indulge and you throw down a big 2000 calorie dinner just good protein, dessert, all that. Yeah, we're um, lucky enough to have a team chef for all the, the big tours and um, you know he's paying a lot of attention to making sure we're getting all the right nutrients from our food and we can kind of just eat until we're full. Um, for safety too with the team chef. Yeah. I mean, you're in these little hotels all through France or whatever and I mean, you don't know what's going on in the kitchen back there and you get sick. I mean, your race and your year of training is ruined for it. So. Uh, I mean, yeah, so it's, it's more of a quality thing first, but then it's the, where you have to eat so often that he has to make it taste good, think about the digestive process and what burns cleanly, anti-inflammatory diets, and yeah, and safety. So. It's, it's important to note also that to do a grand tour and to be at this level, your body is at the absolute limit. There's, there's absolutely no room for error. You're probably the lightest your body can handle without just going to the hospital, and any contagion, any little blip if the meat's not done just right or there's a little maybe that plate was not totally clean your body shuts down and you're and you're not riding the next day and mm -hmm. that's m sometimes more than a year of preparation you know like yeah. it's the dream to yeah. ride some of these tours for these guys probably yourselves included so it's very important that your food is cooked properly and it's mm -hmm. done right yeah awesome a lot of bacon too <laughs> you said a lot of bacon yeah yeah of course <laughs> absolutely um, well, thank you all. Really, really appreciate you being yeah. here and, and taking time out of what I know is a, is a busy schedule with a lot of commitments and obviously a lot of training. Um, hopefully for you all, this has been some, some fun insight into uh, the life that these guys lead every day. Um, certainly encourage you to watch them and follow them in the upcoming racing season. Uh, we're really looking forward to that for sure. Um, and hopefully this has been a neat insight too into, into how some of the technology that we have here at CA is, is supporting um, a cycling team. But, but there's a lot of great analogies between what we're doing with, with Trek Sigafredo and what we do every day um, in enabling and supporting software development teams all over the world. Um, and with that, I think we will adjourn. Um, these guys are gonna be over in the agility zone at at four uh, for a little more of a casual uh, get together, hang out on the couches over there, ask some questions, um, and would encourage you to come over and, and, uh, and, and join us uh, at that time as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks so thank much you, for having Peter. us. Thank you, Keel. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Awesome.